So, so uh, I'm Alexander Hendoff. I'm uh, helping a lot in the Python community, building programs for conferences. Um, I'm also um, a Python fellow now, so I was quite honored here. And if you want to reach me, just drop me an email or reach on, you can reach me on Twitter. Um, my company, I'm a partner in a digital, we are a digital consulting boutique, so we help people, yes? Oh yes, I have to put it up, so, oh yeah, okay. So you can hear me like this, so that is better. Okay, done, okay, one hand only. Okay, yeah, we're a digital boutique, so and we're consulting uh, enterprises and startups on uh, digital innovation, change management, my part is data science and AI. And also I'm involved in some conferences, but we have lightning talks now, so I can skip your Python is coming, your SciPy is coming. By data Frankfurt is coming <laughs> as well. And um, just to give you a little bit more space, because Chuk just mentioned that ZKM in Karlsruhe. Where is Karlsruhe? Karlsruhe is actually here in southern Germany. You know, look, so here's Zurich. So actually, we're quite close. So the train only takes us like uh, eight, eight hours to get here to Florence. And uh, this is where PyData Südwest is located. Karlsruhe, Heidelberg, Mannheim. It's really easy to, to reach by train. We also had some great speakers. You will also meet them at the conference here, like um, yeah, like Paula is here. Um, and also I want to mention there's uh, PyData Berlin and PyCon.de. We joined the two conferences for one bigger conference in Berlin uh, this year. So um, the call for proposals are currently open for all the conferences I just mentioned. And yeah, I'm looking forward. So um, what is deep learning? Let me little learn a little bit more about yourself. Um, who has worked with deep learning before? Okay, very good. So I have lots of news for you because it's maybe only 20%. So you, but we hear a lot about deep learning and is it something new? Is data science dead now? Or what? what is it machine learning now? Because like this used to be the big thing, data science, artificial intelligence. Is it Terminator or TARDIS? <laughs> or just a hype. So let, let's fix that because the thing with artificial intelligence uh, is just like marketing people are smart because you see machine learning and see deep learning is a part of machine learning. Now the artificial intelligence is the fanciest term just covering everything. So marketing switch to artificial intelligence now and deep learning is just a part of it. And if you see here from the history as well, this goes way back, like way back to the 40s and 50s. So Artificial intelligence actually predates databases. Databases were invented in the 60s. The relational databases were invented in the 70s. So this is like really old tech. So why did it take so long? Um, so there were basic ideas in the 40s. Um, you probably like here in the 50s or 60s, you have seen like from the US, you very often seen have these robo kitchen space jetkins. So you have like fully automated kitchens in black and white style uh, back in the days you probably have seen that so they, they were already like high hopes in the ai space and you uh, if you want to listen to Catherine jamal's keynote she gave at europe python two years ago um, she also mentioned people working in the space had the same concerns we had nowadays about privacy security and all the stuff so check out it's on on youtube so why don't we use artificial intelligence now already all the time um because it takes a lot of computing power. So we have an AI winter. Somebody wrote a book, said, oh no, we're never going to solve artificial intelligence or deep learning mathematically. That's not possible. Everybody followed, and there was only like a minority still working in the space. So it was maybe 5% of the researchers working in the field, and they were like more like exots. Until it changed in the early 2000s, when um, people working on that, no, we have more data, than before, so we can feed the networks with data because we need a lot of labeled data for feeding neural nets. And also we have more and more computing power at our hands and finally the whole thing starts to work here. So the drivers, as mentioned, is data, computer power, parallelization, GPUs, also like the, the idea to run, uh, to train networks on GPUs is, is not that old compared to the, 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 dec the decades we look here. Um, yeah, and frameworks, TensorFlow, Python, all this. Uh, but but what are like the obstacles? I think the biggest ob obstacles is like uh, wrong images because I just Googled artificial intelligence, and I'm really sick. I'm sick seeing this image. Like uh, it's it's a wrong idea. So obstacles: a wrong imagination of AI, sci-fi movies, hype, 
scaremongering like this. Oh, this is the end. We're all going to die. <laughs> so, yes, AI is taking over the world. <laughs> Actually, I'm not a human. I'm an AI. Just trying to convince you AI is good. So, but also, apart from that, lack of budget on time in entropy companies having budgets and time. Because, as Chuck mentioned, go hacking. We have to experiment with this stuff. And I think this is why you will also see a lot of like art or artwork or artistic stuff here. It's, we have a need to experiment to understand technology. And, like, and art is a very good space to experiment and learn without solving problems or having to solve real problems. So, um, yeah. And another problem is we cannot really explain why AI works that well. We basically have a proof of concept. We say, yeah, yeah input, output is quite right, but there's no real proof. So that's the obstacle. So is it, is it the problem solver for everything? No. So very often you see problems being addressed with deep learning can be solved with simple or simpler stuff like regressions. I can really recommend look uh, watch uh, Vincent Warmerdam's talk from Pi Data London last year. Um, it's really good, and also like Gail's talk from Pi Data London um, last year was really good to get more and better idea when to use deep learning and when you have like easier, more explainable, and uh, faster tools at your hand. So, what are the chances? So I think. I'm trying to like get away from the artificial intelligence, Android, sci-fi idea. So what is it good for? I think it's good for automation when like 95% is just like good enough. And think about humans also make errors and the human error rate of 5% is already pretty good. But you probably don't want to put it somewhere where lives depend on it, maybe. But it can be a good tool to solve many problems. Handling, handling, especially when you're handling complex stuff where we humans are, there's so many ifs and buts and maybes, it's hard to handle in our brains. Um, and artificial intelligence and neural networks are really good at that. Um, so um, you could also imagine it from the programming side, when we program, we are very deterministic. If, when, else, if, all this. Think about more like programming, like a blacksmith forging some, some part of steel to build a tool. And so you can build your AI tool, which is probably not perfect, but you know from Game of Thrones, uh, one sword is better than no sword. Oh. And is it also like the end? So I uh, had the pleasure to see uh, um, Gary Paskarov at the uh, AML uh, D in uh, Lausanne uh, earlier this year. So he was uh, talking whole evening. And if you don't know, who knows Gary Kasparov, the chess player? Okay. For those who doesn't know, he was the brain's last stand back when I was younger. Like this is from uh, the 90s. And basically all these clever people like Turing or Weiner and Shannon and Benit, like these were like the theoretical forethinkers of computers and everything. They said, their claim was, if a machine is able to beat a human in chess, that's the end. They superseded us. But this happened already. So. And we're still here. And I really like this because he was probably, with chess computers, he was the world-class chess player. He was the Magnus Carlsen of his time. So he was a pop star as well. So this was like really big in the news and everything. And did, does he complain? No, he said AI is great. It's a great tool. And even if it's like superseding now the chess players from the rankings, we can learn. We can learn how to better. It's a tool. Or I think this is a really nice quote from Pablo Kipasso. He mentioned, "Computers are useless. They only give uh, can give us answers." And I think this is a very good way to put it. So, um, in this talk, let me introduce you to some stuff I played around with uh, AI. So, first, I want to introduce you to CNNs. CNNs is a convolutional neural network. It's inspired by the, tr the structure of the brain from its like going research on mammals on the 50s, 1950s, and 60s. Um, so if you know, it's just like um, we don't see in our eyes, we see in our brain. So this is just sensor, and this is like the processing unit here back in our brains. Um, and the, uh, the CNN basically picked up this idea in um, the 80s. And basically, this has how it works. We take a picture, we take a piece of the picture, extract the main features from here, put it to the next layer, we do the same on this layer, we do the same on this layer, and this is like the convolution here. And finally, 
we, we feed everything here into a fully connected network for labeling and classification. So and this is basically how a fully connected network looks like. We have some input data. This is just like numbers. We have these hidden layers and we have an output. And these hidden layers, they react to the signals they receive. So for example, this his layer um, reacts to like these, yeah, is it like here, like that, or so. This likes to like, I, I like shades, for example. So if we see something like this in this picture, one of these neurons will give us a high probability. So these are all like probabilities. At the end, we just have likelihoods. So it's very likely this is a woman. It's maybe 98% sure it's a woman, and maybe 2% it's a man, or something like that, as an output. So what can we use CNNs for? We can use it to denoise corrupted images, for example. So this looks like a postcard after you put it in your pocket in the washing machine, and deep learning, because a convolutional neural network can learn on pictures and basically learn how stuff looks out there in the world, like these shapes, and basically help to reconstruct um, an image like that with a better resolution. It can be used to, it's called impainting. So we have a picture of a library here, and so there's some parts are missing, and the neural network is able to fix it. Remove text from images. And probably you have seen uh, YOLO, you only look once. So this is quite popular also on YouTube. You can see like the, this is a person and this. So yeah, and very often in research paper, papers and online and blogs, of course, you see nice stuff. Some of these images or most of them are in a low resolution space. So, and you have to be aware, neural networks are sometimes easy to fool in weird ways. And let's look at this. This is quite recent research here. So these are two researchers. They just published a paper this month. And they're using YOLO. And you see this guy. This is my favorite, this is my favorite part. Hello, I'm a human. I'm a person. Why don't you see me? They just put this image here. And YOLO does no longer recognize him as a person. But it's a chair there. And, and you see this. So neural networks. Um, they are not intelligent at all. They're actually like highly trained idiots. But they're very good at doing, they are going good, special, like the specialized tasks, they can be really good. And the good thing is we can, it's like computers, servers, we can scale here. So we see um, here. But they also like, to, we can fool them. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, I could watch it all day. I totally agree, but let, let's go on. <laughs> so yeah, so it's not so you. It's not only you look once. So uh, let me tell you my story so far. Uh, I came up with the idea. Uh, so I've I've talked about this uh, at Pi Data Berlin last year, or EuroPython, uh, some other conferences. You can see the videos online, and I cover different parts deeper or less deeper in here. My inspiration came actually from Gene Kogan. He is an AI artist. He spoke at Pi Data London uh, in 2017. There's also a video online. And he showed about a lot of cool stuff you can do. And finally, I had the chance to get an eGPU for my computer. But so I have an NVIDIA graphic card here. Graphic cards are good for the calculations and the math we need to do for deep learnings. And they, they, we can, we can, yeah, it, it runs way faster on GPUs. They are made for the calculations like this. So, but for PyTorch and everything, it's not plug and play. You have to compile PyTorch for the Mac. And also, Mac is no longer updating the NVIDIA drivers. So um, I basically had to complain to Tim Cook, which I don't like complaining on Twitter, but I was like totally desperate. And so, um, yeah, let's just go to the cloud or get a Linux box for that. But anyway, so I have my local lab here as an idea to um, develop ideas and build stuff. And uh, if I need to scale it or have it run uh, longer, I can take it to the cloud. So my first journey, my journey jotted with style transfer. Who has heard about style transfer? Yeah, OK, oh, cool, wow. Only like 10%. So let me introduce you to style transfer. Uh, it's from 2015 in Tübingen, Germany. Um, Basically, style tattoo, the idea is um, get this is a Van Gogh image, learn how it's being painted, apply it to a photograph, and make the photograph look like in a Van Gogh style. That's style transfer. You can do it like with Van Gogh, different pictures, Munch, 
um, cubism, and many stuff. So I thought, okay, let's try this. And as a child, back in the 80s, I was in French comics. And so this is Verlaine or Veronique in Germany. It's Verlaine in Laurelaine in French. Uh, there's also the Italian version. I don't remember the name. So it says like it's in the, and probably you know the Valerian movie two, three years ago. So this is like a French comic from the 80s. I really fancied it. They're a team, a man and a woman team. So I w it's like nice. And this is how um, a modern Flash comic from DC looks like. And I wondered, and I was just like trying to how does style transfer work? And I took a page from an old comic, like this, trained the style here, applied it to this image. And basically, this was the result. This was my first ever AI style transfer. It was just like going, oh, wow, AI, deep learning can solve everything. I mean, this is just like, it's amazing, isn't it? So it was like, oh, my God, so let's do more. Also, fun fact, uh, until like three days ago, I didn't realize I'm also certified by Stan Lee to talk about comics. So I did this course at EDX a few years ago. I just remembered. So Stan Lee, the Batman guy. So I know about comics, but I'm not a comic fan, actually. I like the comic style, but today I don't, I, I hardly read comics. But back to the style we learned here. You can apply it to photographs from Scotland on holiday. You can apply it to pictures taken at museums, like here the tiger um, uh, in, in, the in the thunderstorm or something like that, and applied here and said, hey, this looks good. You can even train it on different styles. So uh, the, uh, the square up there is the original picture from the comic. The style is uh, being applied to the picture, Scotland, and the Night King. <laughs> yeah, he's, oh no, I don't want to spoil. Uh, so, sorry. <laughs> so, you can even apply the style to a whole comic page. And lo it looks like this. So, very good. So, what, what's the use? What, so, why is it important to experiment? I was just wondering how will it look like on an old Flash comic. So, this is a really, this is an old Flash comic back from the 40s, 50s. I was only able to find like a blurry image here. And this is basically compared to this, this would be like the size here. So it's hard to read. Applying the style, we see, of course, the coloring style, but it's also like really good to read. And this was just like a finding on my way because I was experimenting. And I think this is important to understand the tech, to see chances. We have to go back to more open experimentation. Like programming is not just about, okay, we have this business problem, can you do our SAP migration? or build an AP or Kubernetes and all this. This is all good tech, but we have to keep an open mind here to see the chances and to learn the chances. Um, so you can also like, for example, train it on another picture like here, like this is like this one. You can even feed like white noise in there. So this is just like noi white noise and wow. So I tweeted it to friends. I said, hey, I'm Tate Modern. I'm a Tate Modern. I really fancy this picture. And I said, oh yeah, it's a great picture. Um, yeah, so this is just like, Generate. So how does this work? So this is like again our convolutional layers. The, uh, so basically the the uh, the, the style, tr style transfer is, is a CNN with some tweaks and extra algorithms. So we have the picture, the style we want to train here. In this example, like Van Gogh, Starry Night, and then we feed it to the network. All this stuff, I don't want to go too deep into the tech here, but you see certain features are being picked up. It's probably hard to see here on the slides from the back. But we train this picture, feed it, and basically you can you, you do it, you only don't you don't only do it with like one picture, with you do it with many pictures. So for example, I use the Coco data set, it's an open data set with like 70,000 images, but probably like 500 will be good enough to get you started. So, but you can download Coco from also open source. So, yeah, so basically the idea is compare this to images from the world, extract how we have strokes, shapes, and how shapes are made and colors, and the, the network basically remembers this. So, you see, this is like if I would train on the tiger, we had like this convolutional representation, which is let's just like reduced, then we feed it to the network, and once we feed a new style, uh, we, we have, once you have learned a style, we can apply it to this image, have a new style. And I made a video how 
actually how it looks like when a neural net learns. So, yes, so. So now we are feeding like nine, one, per second 192 pictures we learn on. And then I always say, okay, apply the style you have learned already to a picture. And this is, these are the results. You see, like, the network actually learns pretty fast, but the tuning at the end gets slower and slower and slower and slower. Like, you can do like a lot, you can get far in a short time, but the details take way more time. So, so, but you see, like, there's always like, this, these are like the gradients you see here working, like with the flickering going back and forth and adapting and finding the right spot in the network. So this is um, what we call a loss function with different gradients. You see like in the beginning, so the loss is, if it's, if it, the, the, if it's bad, we have a high loss. If it's good, we have a low loss. We see in the beginning, it, the, it, the loss drops really fast, but then it's going really slow. So yeah, so things may take time, although you may see first results pretty soon. And then we can take this picture, Tiger on a Tropical Storm from uh, Henri Mas Rousseau. Um, yeah, it's an excerpt from this picture and apply different comic styles to that. So this is a style I trained on a Möbius collage. So Möbius is also a French uh, science fiction comic artist from uh, the 80s. Um, you can train it on Franz Marx, Tiger. So you see already, okay, we, the, we pick up certain features from the network, but this tiger is not just like painted like this tiger. We just transfer styles and strokes and colors here. And this is why I think style transfer is really good to understand the technology behind it because we have this visual connection. What wor what's working, not. We can use another thing from Valerian Veronique here. Um, we can use a Batman comic from Batman 59, Batman in the future from 1950. And you see always like this, the tiger actually works really well uh, on many styles. You can take a picture from Leonardo here. The La Dorazione del Maggi, which is here, Maggi, which is a recent found. It's an unfinished painting. But you see this is maybe not so as spectacular as the other ones. But you can see like, okay, we have, it's also you could use it like as a filter, like to do, use only uh, special colors like here, because this is basically just like, like sepia style color here, because it's just like the the, um, the sketch. I also tried because the, the, on Google, Google has these great art images with like monster resolution. So this is like really like you see really like the paint here. Basically, can touch the paint here. It's like super resolution. Like it's like maybe five gigabytes or more um, um, uh, pictures. So if I just learn on Van Gogh strokes here, you get something like this here. Um, you basically picks up the, pe the, the texture. We only have like gray and blue and a little bit green here. And this is basically what the network learns, knows and applies to the picture. You can also like put something like Giger in there. Giger is the guy that's like in Swiss, um, maybe like a dark artist, um, but he invented Alien, the alien monster. This is why he's very popular. And then you can even like get here, let's just like have like black and white and apply it here and get these like shapes drawn. You can also use just Picasso. This is also some a picture which general this style generalizes well here. Um, so it's not making this into an abstract painting, but you see like you get the shapes the, and the coloring here, and so on. And you can do use like the Fantastic Four. And since if you think now, okay, I can just take my favorite picture and make my own style. Oh, it's not not always working. Has anybody an idea why this is not working? This is just like people on the beach. It's a very simple image, but the sun is just like a crazy hole here. You have an idea? Anyone? Huh? It's yeah, it's overexposed, but actually my theory is, um, my thesis there, I, I think actually the, the the, the data sets are biased. The Coco data set, for example, it's being made from American universities, so we see a bias here. Would you, if you want to create a nice data set of the world, put a picture with backlight in there? I doubt there's a picture with backlight at all in the data set, so the neural net doesn't really know how to deal with it. It's just like a theory I have, I've, uh, yeah, but you see, okay, why does you see, okay, this is not working, and you can wonder why and see, okay, Maybe the data set is biased, maybe another thing. <laughs> but you can also get creative and use it like this. Um, so we see uh, 
an evil queen from Game of Thrones, an unpopular pay prim prime minister, can get some accessoires from uh, the internet and people protesting. IKEA has better cabinets in the UK. You can make this into like a really simple collage. Just in preview, this is maybe just like five minutes work. No Photoshop, no skills. Um, that's it. And apply to style to it. And I have a picture like this. <laughs> uh, this is again on very unique. And I, for example, have a picture like this. And for example, here I took a whole comic page with a lot of white. And then you see suddenly like um, areas tend to be more white. Except for the evil queen, she stays back, although this is just like an area. So it's not as simple as that, but you see basically how this starts to work together. Of course, Picasso always works. So, so let's talk about what, what, what matters more or less. So let's take a picture. Let's take this picture. Yeah, who knows this? Oh, come on. <laughs> so, have you been to the old town? I mean, this is like the epicenter of old town here. It's the Piazza della Signora. So this is the Palazzo Vecchio. And you know, you can have some averages from Endgame. You can do a shitty collage. <laughs> you can apply a style. And you have a picture. And nobody will say, hey, how did you draw this? Actually, I did something similar with the picture we used for Europython. Somebody thought on Twitter I painted it. And I said, no, no, it's just like AI. Um, but here we see a full resolution. Maybe, uh, maybe check the slides later. So I've uploaded everything. It's maybe hard to see here. But for example, you see like, like here, especially uh, uh, on the Palazzo, you see like it's quite details, the stones. If you l use a lower resolution, so the picture now being fed into the, the, the to, to, to be styled by the network has only exactly half the resolution. And you see, of course, it's already simplified. You see, like, less stones. This is basically now an area. Before, we had, like, stones here. And you see, so, of course, pixel size matters. Um, and, of course, if you think about how the network works, how a style array works, it's quite obvious. But you can get a good grasp on it with style like this. So you can also do it with high contrast. So this is like the original picture. High contrast looks like this. So it's also just like a little bit um, switching and playing around here, feeding it to the network. Also gives us a little different impression. So also, of course, the input matters a lot as well. But what about black and white pictures? What's your guess? What's the difference if we use a black and white picture now? Hmm, let's see. It works, actually. It, it actually, it doesn't really, uh, there's no obvious difference. So as you see, like the, the CNN picks up a lot on shapes and things. The color matters, but it's not, it matter, doesn't matter as much as the shapes. So you, and even like the, the colors, probably most many times are, are a good fit to reality. So going back to black and white, and maybe you can use like another style for Mobius here. Um, so basically, this is how just like it would look like in another um, with an original picture or just like another style from Mobius, which is learned similar. And of course, this not this not only applies to images, it also applies to movies. And let me, yeah. So you can also now use it, of course, uh, for. I saw all these people die. I keep telling everybody they should move on. Some do, but not us. Yeah, sorry for there's a lot of pathos here. So yeah, I also uploaded this, so you can even watch it later if you want. So my what my was my vision? So I said I got really overexcited about deep learning when I did my first style transfer. So I said, okay, what about doing um, this? Maybe this is this. So who has ever seen this? Yes, 
This is something very German. It's the drei Fragezeichen, the three question marks, or the three investigators. Uh, it's actually an American jewel detective book series, which was a total flop in the US, but is super popular in Germany. It's around since 1964. Uh, basically, when I grew up, when I was little, I had like the, these taped radio dramas. We called them Hörspiele. Hörspiele is a real thing in Germany. There's a lot of podcasts on Hörspiele. So what's a Hörspiel? Hörspiel is like a movie without the picture. You, you have the sound, you have, can imagine it, it's a story, it's a dramatization. And on the Drei Fragezeichen, that's why I thought, let's try this, because we have 200 tape radio dramas, um, so we have some data. Um, and the, my, my quest is, is this data enough to recreate it in some artificial way? Um, so uh, Hörspiel, it's yeah, as I told, it's I think the, the best translation is taped radio drama. Um, uh, you probably heard of um, um, Orson Welles and the War of the Worlds. So back in the days, now imagine we are pre-television. We are uh, pre-internet, pre-television. We're in the 1920s. People listen to the radio. They listen to the radio like this. They go there's some player and they go and listen and. They were radio dramas. They were like the movies of that time. And the young genius, Orson Welles, he was involved in tape radio dramas, but he came up with something new. The War of the Worlds was actually made like um, a live reporter was telling about the US being invaded by aliens. And of course, since it was a new medium, people believed it. Oh my fuck, we were invaded by aliens. So they, people panicked, actually. So this was a great. Uh, 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 masterpiece. So let's how does the drei Fragezeichen sound and look like? And okay, sorry, this is German, but. Hier, Kollegen, lest selber. Ihr würdet es mir nicht glauben, wenn ich es euch vorlese. Ihr würdet glauben, ich spinne. Wie kann eine 3000 Jahre alte Mumie flüstern? Yeah, so how can a 3000 year old mummy whisper? That question here. So we need, we need a story, we need dialogues, we need a cover, we need spoken word. So these are the questions to explore. What resources are required in a neural network, data acquisition, costs and time, which problems can we potentially solve in the future, being open-minded to recreate this? And spoiler alert, it didn't really work. As I didn't create any artificial radio drama, but I learned a lot on the way. And there were also like some amazing findings. So how did I um, uh, go into uh, the realization? So I had text and transcripts um, from people and the recordings, of course. Um, and I decided always to use the same process, to get data, clean the data, research a paper on a working solution uh, from the internet. There's a lot. Verify, actually, this is working. And then adapt this solution for my use case, and then go for maximizing the quality. This is always the same approach. And so this is always my best advice. If you go into the space, exchange one variable at a time, not two. Change one thing, see if it's working, and then change the next thing. Don't change two. Two can be also really bad already, because it's hard to figure out where the mistake actually is. OK, let's go for the artwork, because that's what where, where I started from. These are drei Fragezeichen covers. This is like the artwork as a CD, and half of them were fake already. So maybe in Germany this is more appreciated, but yeah, sorry. But I think you get the idea. What about speech? So and this is where neural networks R and Ns come in, um, and there's a great blog post from Andrew Capassi uh, from him when he's in his PhD time. Now he's uh, the chief data scientist from Tesla. And in this blog post, he is, explains like RNNs, um, which I'm going to play, explain in a bit. And you can create Shakespeare texts with these RNNs. So feed some Shakespeare in, get Shakespeare out. And if you want to learn a more, more about Shakespeare, uh, Marco is giving a talk on Sunday about this more depth. So I'm going to go really fast. So I got um, a, a work corpus with like 1.5 million words. And this is how an RNN looks like. So we have an input, we have an output, and uh, the idea here is we uh, always like keep a hidden layer. So this basically, this is like a little bit, you can imagine like a little memory here. So it's not just like in, out. Um, so this is not deterministic. We always have some kind of memory here saying, okay, if the letter 
like how how likely are these letters appearing next to each other and not only directly you can span it to like 200 300 characters wide with probabilities and RNNs, for example, this is why I, I like love PyTorch. This is like um, like an one type of RNM is an LSTM. This is a little bit more advanced type. It's a long-term, short-term memory. Actually, it was also invented by Jürgen Schmidt-Huber. Um, so, and uh, this is how you can you ca as as you can code your network in PyTorch. So you don't have to worry so much about coding a network. There's a lot of blog posts and explanations and the PyTorch side is really great. So this is one nice finding. This is like the black magic part, but this is actually not complicated. You can build on the shoulder of giants here. So here's just like you basically instruct how you want to build your network, how many layers, how many neurons, input, output, and all this. And yeah, and for the training, uh, so there's still some stuff to do. Uh, this is how I want to train my network. This is my input, output, and this is a decoder. And also, I can share with you, most of the work is preparing the data for the networks. So running the stuff is, I mean, I wouldn't say it's trivial, but like getting the data right, the getting them in shape is, can be work. So let's do this with Dante. So who knows Dante? At least, at least half of the audience is Italian. So, <laughs> because who's Dante? For those of you who don't know, Dante La Divina Commedia, the Divine Comedy. It's an Italian long narrative. It was uh, basically uh, made in the early 14th century from uh, Dante, who was uh, a politician, intellectual, uh, pharmacist. Because, uh, fun fact, they sold books and pharmacies then in Florence. He's from Florence, that's the connection here to PyCon X. And it's considered one of the great works in Italian literature, in world liter literature even, even, and the revolutionary thing here was he was writing in Italian at a time where everything was written in Latin. So, so this was like, it's like similar to what we have in Germany with Luther. Luther translated the Bible into German, and this was the defining moment for the German language. Um, so, because also in Germany, fun fact, Everything else, everything was written in Latin. Basically, this was like a closed society of knowing things. We need to speak Latin. And basically, this is about uh, how he imagined the afterlife. I mean, basically, of course, we have uh, strict rules. We have hell, inferno. It's like the seven layers of hell. Then we have purgatory. So uh, if you didn't know about God and Christianity, you end up in purgatory at that time. So you, you did nothing wrong but you're not good enough to go to heaven. To Paradiso, which is like the nine layers of paradise. So this is like, and he's like this journey. Of course, we have here very medieval um, thinking of the world. This is how it reads. So at the left, it's Italian, um, medieval Italian. At the rest, the, the right side is the, an English translation. So you see like it's more like, it's very, it's also like quite pathetic. So let's. Uh, so I took this text corpus. It's uh, 100,000 words. It would take you like seven hours to read. It's half a megabyte of data. And what happens if we feed this into an RNN and produce text as we would produce Shakespeare text, as in a blog post? And this is how it looks like, actually. And with the help of some Italian friends, I was able to pick some stuff because my, my Italian is really bad, especially my medieval Italian is really bad. And actually my peer says, this is funny. I see some smiles. Yeah, so, and I put, this is also, I put, this is like actually the Google translation uh, because sometimes the Google translation is not that bad uh, for stuff like that. Weirdly not bad because it translates stuff, it understands and keeps the words it does not know. And this is like just like another example. So, noon to the convivio buddies. Uh, you see, like, but if I would see this and you'd say this is like a medieval Italian text, I couldn't say to see the difference. For me, this looks like super Italian. But <laughs> so, and this is also like, see, you see, like, 
language is, 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 is way more defined. We know more about and, and we have a higher expectation on language than on, on, on pictures because now on the pictures it's really easy to impress you actually because the space is open, it's not defined. But you can say, is your grammar right? Is the word right? Do I know the word? And probably, yeah, so this is also like a w the, the, the whole space is way harder. But yeah, so one more example. Uh, and sweet, uneven, if the back and its name uh, so it sounds like to me even like medieval stuff. So, okay. I also did this in German if somebody knows German. <laughs> so this was also like a really nice translation from Google Translate. So it made works like Prüx or Schlokoliana up. They sound German, but they don't exist. So the red words are invented. The other words actually exist. The grammar sucks. So, so it doesn't make any sense either. But so I said, okay, I'm talking, I'm thinking about dialogues. It actually was a hit because like, you know, like from the style transfer, it was like, oh, yes, and oh, now that. So actually, so I thought, okay, what else? So I, I, what about chatbots? Because I'm looking to solve people talking to each other in the radio drama. So what about chat law? Chat, chatbots are about dialogue. And I read about this great paper. It was about somebody fed Star Trek The Next Generation into a neural network and build a chatbot and put it on Twitter. So let's try this. So this is Captain Picard chatbot. I tweeted Captain Picard and I made it simpler. I even said I didn't make up any crazy stuff. I started with one line, I am Lucutus of Borg. I mean, this is a, an original sentence from the script to make it even easier for the network to respond. Uh, but actually, it was just like noise and it took like a week until I got rid of this chatbot. Um, so, yeah, so also like fancy paper, cool blog posts, reality check. Yeah, well, hmm, not so. Though, I um, have to point out, for translation, this works really well. So most of the, a lot of the translation stuff you see on Google and everywhere is RNNs because you can align sentences, words from two languages. So the corpus from the European Union, everything from the European Union is translated in all the European languages. So this is like a really good text corpus to learn and it works really well. And but why doesn't it work? I also, I have to find out. I just looked at my book um, shelf and said, okay, the whole space is not new. Look at these books. I mean, they're not retro style 80s. They are 80s. So um, the space is not new, and it's another new learning thing. Um, m many of these problems have been addressed, discussed, thought about, and it's 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 a good idea sometimes to look into an old book first before thinking about how could I reinvent the wheel. So next step. What about speech? I have to also fabricate spoken language. And I don't want to use just like an Alexa the that. So there's a network for that as well. It's uh, called uh, Takotron2. Uh, this, uh, this is basically the network. It's not so important how it works, but the, the, the most important stuff about Takotron here is it works on MEL spectrograms. What is a MEL spectrogram? MEL spectrogram is basically, you see like frequencies here. So if I speak something like this, you see the MEL spectrogram of the vowels, of the, uh, the words, everything I say can be translated into these spectrograms. And the network learns from these pictures and the, the text aligned, and that's it. And this sounded like the most crazy idea to me. This cannot work, and so I tried it. And also, um, I built on the NVIDIA um, Tacotron 2 implementation, uh, which is on, in GitHub, which is also a really nice piece of code. Because the other thing is, a lot of the code in the deep learning space in Jupyter Notebooks is not really good. It's not production ready. It's not transportable. It's, yeah, it's not good. But this was a really good piece of code as well. So let's try this. So I found an, 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 a set of um, um, 24 hours of audio. And I trained it. Um, so I had 24 hours of audio read by one female reader and the text aligned. It was like snippets of five seconds to 60 seconds. I just took the audio and the text and fed it onto the network and this is the result. What about the help? It was in the head. And I had new oral rings. It had had another thing in the head. I had not had it with. It's actually, it's reading this text here. Once upon a time there was a little more concern. 
But see, like, it's a little scary. It sounds human, but you don't understand the word. This was like after 10 hours of training. So let's see what's, let's see what, how, how far did we get after 14 hours? Why, it's a poem, darling, is it? I've been meaning me, scary. All over the list, but I've been worried in the class. I've been dating in the building building, seven. Uh, yeah, something happened here. It's I can pick up words. And after nine days... Once upon a time, there was a little mermaid named Siren who lived with her stepmother under the sea. She didn't get to go out of the sea like any other. So the thing here is I trained this on one CPU, one, one 800 euro C, GPU. I had a text. I fed it. This is probably something I would put as or say, hey, Apple, do you want to play Siri? But... It's super low budget on a really good data set, and I think this is quite quite convincing. So actually here it was like, wow, well, I didn't expect it. I didn't see this coming. So let's do this in German. <laughs> so of course, what's the problem in the NLP space? The problem in NLP space, everybody works in English. Uh, even the German researchers, because they want to public, but they want to publish globally, work a lot in English. So how can we solve this? Let's do this. So actually, I need to build a German corpus with audio snippets, text of the audio snippets. So I thought about audiobooks, newspapers with audios, and I need people or somebody to recreate, to, to prepare the data set. So I talked to my business partner, Sia, and said, hey, Sia, can we get like two, can I get like two free people for some time to work on my data set? And Sia said, hey, Alex, I, I really love your talks, but no. So, uh, so okay, uh, so I had to see use my brain, how can I solve this? Um, so, I have the newspaper, I have a subscription of the newspaper, I have a subscription for the audio part of the newspaper. And so I have text, I have a spoken newspaper articles, and basically my approach then was take the audio, get it to the transcription service to get the time index when which word was spoken, and then take this information and combine it with some heuristics to build my own snippets with SOX, which is a Unix library, to cut audios. And um, one learning, for example, was the transcription service I used for Google, it wasn't that accurate. So it actually the contents was right, but it was not word by word spoken. So I had to use a lot of heuristics, but in the end, it did work okay and quite well. So. Um, and so that's another learning because I assumed, okay, this is all solved because we hear the keynotes and Google and all the stuff. And in, for example, in, in, in Germany, the, for German, there's only a Google transcription service with AI. There's nothing on Asia, nothing on ABM, nothing on AWS, and Apple is limited to iOS apps only. So uh, it's also like a learning. You read about something, it's being solved for English language in the US, but it doesn't apply to European languages. So the data set, uh, so I have newspaper uh, articles read from the website and let's just like play it. At first I'm going to play the original audio, how it sounds like. Deutschland darf kein Talent vergeuden, so heißt es immer wieder. Wo aber bleiben in unseren Schulen die Angebote für die besonders Talentierten? After 14 hours. Deutschland darf kein Talent vergeuden, and after 10 days, So actually, given, uh, given my input, and which is not as accurate, it's not human-made as the other data set, but I thought this was quite okay as well, I was quite impressed as well. Uh, how to solve it. So um, I thought my plan actually was get more data by the same speaker because another learning was the, the, the articles are read by different persons and because I didn't solve my, I wasn't able to solve my uh, speaker derealization which is saying separating this is one speaker another automatically I did it manually at night and so I had like three female voices in a may, main male data set and basically just like the because female voices are more on a higher level than male voices and it the, the network didn't really pick up a lot at that time it was just blubbering because networks don't generalize well once i narrowed it down to i hope one speaker it worked like this 
but I said, okay, just get more data in, audiobooks, all this, but then this is another learning in the AI space. There's new stuff coming all the time. October, BERT, it's like also another encoder. Transformer X, GDP, GDP2, <laughs> WAF to letter. I mean like every month something amazing is published and so it's really hard, it's always like a hard decision. Do I pursue with my plan or has somebody offered or proposed a better solution here? The space is fast moving. So taking a break here. Um, so I need more like five. Hmm? And so you already learned from Chuck about GANs. So I don't have to explain you GANs. Yeah, I mean, you have a faker, you have a discriminator. This guy starts to fool this guy. You give feedback, how good, how good did you try to fool me? And then you train against each other to get um, the network. And there's some nice stuff you can do here as well. So um, it's a very hot thing. So I just want to cover some parts from the paper here. For example, probably you have seen like the switch. You can switch zebras to horses from the style. You can also switch a horse to a zebra. <laughs> you can switch summer and winter. So this is basically how they just used the first uh, the first season of Game of Thrones for the last season, game, winter, and so it's all AI. You can use it for a bokeh effect, which you probably won't see here. Um, does it always work? Some other amazing stuff, also with a high res, because also like if you look at these pictures, this is probably like 256 pixels. This is like a tiny picture. So always see, your brain, if you look at the stuff online, your brain also fools you with, with like fixing things. And we'll see a next example, which is like most impressive. This is from NVIDIA. This is, these, these people don't exist. They are all computer generated. Yes, that's it, you can go home hide somewhere on a farm in Tuscany and hope to survive. But then, so can we make fake people, fake news, fake, 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 fake? Let's have a closer look. If you have a closer look, you see, hey, what's this extra hair here? What's this spot? This is like a perfect, I mean, this is a perfect makeup. Why is the spot here? What's up with the lips here? Here, the eyes. Also, if you look at the eyes, they have different sizes, which are quite s s very unusual with humans. We have, what's this, actually? And what's this? And what's about with the hair up there? So you see, it's, it's, of course, if you look at it, if you see and see it fast, it looks really good. If you look closer, you still have these artifacts. So we're not, we're not lost yet. So we're still able to see and these artifacts, for example. Uh, if you want to get a better understanding under the hood about neural nets, go to um, the Stillpub. It's a great website. You can move the mouse over this picture, see what the network sees, and get a deeper insight and a better understanding what's being picked up, how it translates. Um, if you want to start from scratch, like with some boiler code, there's another great site, Papers with Code. It was just launched a few months ago. So you have a paper and a code and you can just like try to reproduce it and learn from that. And I want to finish with some questions which people ask me already. So I'm basically stealing the Q&A now from you. <laughs> How long does it take? So actually, it, take, it, it depends on the complexity, on the data, on the problem you're trying to address, the dead, the, of course, the hardware. Um, and number two, how long does it take? Number two, the training takes time, applying the networks is really fast compared to that. So can we, we can take hours and hours and days, and if you look at the audios, it took like 10 days to train the network. I can apply it. You just get a model, you feed new data, and you get a result almost immediately. So serving the results is really fast. So for example, this morning, yes, Valerio, not today. Yeah, just like into a comic. And actually, while I was listening to Chuck's talk, I was doing a little announcement for this talk here. So Florence has finally found the right team to handle the invasion of tourists. Like the picture you saw already, somebody replied, hey, I was missing Machiavelli. And I said, while listening to Chuck, yeah, let's fix this. So Machiavelli, I just added. So this is, can be really fast. And I have this on train. I just applied this model on my computer. No GPUs, maybe it takes a minute because GPUs are slower than, um, uh, CPUs are slower than GPUs for stuff like that, but 
I can just do it sitting there and listening to a talk. Um, why does it sometimes not work? Bias data sets, the data quality is just not good enough because it, the, the, the neural nets don't generalize well. Always remember that. Feed them high quality. The better the input, the better the output. It's a very old rule. You say, yeah, you will say, rubbish in, rubbish out. Um, what's a model, actually? Because we have this model, model. Actually, if you in Python, uh, it's a pickle file. If you don't know a pickle file, a pickle file is basically just the, 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 the object in Python saved to a file. So it's actually not ma magic. It's a pickle file with not dot .pickle, it's dot .model. There's a new format called ONCS, which is more like an open, uh, interchangeable format. You can train on PyTorch, have it run in the TensorFlow environment, for example. So there's a new approach. So the, the frameworks you train on, they don't matter as much. With ONCS and the ONCS standard, you can serve it in different environments as well. Uh -huh. Some pro tips. Document your work. I mean, I'm not able to really reproduce my first uh, things because I didn't document well, um, code probably, and as I mentioned before, like the code in notebooks is really bad, and especially in the deep learning space, um, sometimes hard to follow. People always rely on people, uh, functions rely on stuff being defined outside the, 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 the functions, so many closures. Um, version the data, think about the data you use. Think, of course, domain expertise. Um, DevOps skills can help if you want to go to the cloud just to fire something up to get stuff working. Now, that was fun. What's the profit? You can use, for example, a pay service to apply styles to holiday pictures, movie to comic. So I can take pictures from a comic, uh, from the movie, and make a comic of it. Instructions manuals made from videos. Some ideas, speech synthesizer in business, okay, safe resources, production, supply chain, financial services, increase creativity as a, as a creativity tool, and yeah, and gain from assistance systems. And that's it. Thank you very much. So Thank you. So, some questions? answered and it's okay okay so enjoy your lunch okay thank and you if you have questions i ask me <laughs>